Sewer Smith, the awesome guy he is, was recently kind enough to sit down with me to talk about music. Now, if you don't know Stuart, he's an incredible guitar player who you actually should know from bands like Sweet and his own band Heaven and Earth, who actually just has a new album released quite recently. So go check it out because it features my friend George on the organ. And you guys know George, he played organ in many of my videos, bringing John Earth's immortal magic to life. And the other album I really like from Heaven and Earth is, is Dig, so I recommend listening to that too, because they play just the right kind of organ and guitar sort of rock music that us purple fans really enjoy. But the other thing you might not know about Stuart is he's actually a good close personal friend of Richie Blackmore. And he was nice enough to let me bombard him with questions about the man. It is a rather long video, but I urge everyone to watch the whole thing. We talk about Blackmore's gear like amps, guitars, scalloping, techniques like picking, vibrato, and just some general uh, lessons about playing and music, and even Roger Grover's take on where sound or guitar tone comes from. In addition, we can also hear personal stories about Blackmore that us fans never get to see, or that side of him we never get to see. So it's pretty cool to hear those stories, not to mention Stuart himself lived a pretty fascinating life. So I really enjoyed talking to him and I hope you'll enjoy listening to our conversation. Once again, Stuart, thank you so much for taking the time to do this with me and I really appreciate it and I hope you guys will enjoy and appreciate it as well. So if you have any questions or sooner, leave them in the comment section below. And without further ado, let's take this. So, thank you so much for taking the time to, well, just talk to me about some guitar stuff. You're welcome. Really awesome of you. I would like to talk about you and your musical experiences. And I just basically, I'm interested in you as well. So I don't just wanna flood you with that more questions. I think it's just as important to talk about your your musical journey and then tie back more into that, if that's cool with you. Thank you. Yeah, we can, and we can go over those questions you gave me as well. Well, first of all, before we start, I want to say that I really like the new album. And that, that's one of the topics I wanted to, to talk about later, is how to integrate, well, Blackmore style or Deep Purple Rainbow style songwriting, but don't just copy them, because I think you guys kind of do a great job of that because it's it's easy to either get far away from that style or get too close that's that's already copying something that's they already did that so yeah it's funny it's uh <laughs> i was at uh uh my friend simon wright our drummer he used to be with acdc and dio and he had a halloween party and uh went there and he was he had the music on just rotation and uh, I think it was uh, the album with Anya on came on, and there was it, it just it was just going through the whole album, and I was just talking to Simon, and I, I didn't know it was recognize it. I, I didn't recognize it at first. I said, "God, that guy sounds like me." <laughs> it was Richie. <laughs> I, I feel it sometimes, yeah. Uh, but that's in your case, listening listening to you playing playing the guitar. I think it's, it's definitely in the tasteful category that you can hear there's, there's strong influence, but it's not, not as obvious as, as with me. If I'm playing something rock style, that's, that's something that I guess Blackmore would have played on a really bad night. So, so that, but that's probably just my, my self critique as well. But I really I like it. Yeah. Yeah, you've, you've, got a, you've got a very good ear. Yeah, I mean, not, not a lot of people can pick out what Richie does because his technique is so good. And, sure. you know, he, he's not one of these linear guys that go like this. I mean, exactly. he did sweeps around the time of um, uh, uh, um, Long Live Rock and Roll. Mm -hmm. in, he did started doing a few sweeps, but it was just, and he was the one who started it. And then, you know, people got hold of it and, and that I mean, he really started the neoclassical movement when it came when he brought out Burn. Exactly, 
And in fact, back on in the days of Machine Head, um, there was an alternate solo re release for Smoke on the Water. And it's, you can even tell the beginnings of the neoclassical style he was developing. Yeah, I heard it solo on one of the remaster bonus deluxe editions, and, and I definitely agree. And, and the same with, with, uh, with Highway Star. That progression in there is uh, totally Bach-ish, and that had to be, of course, I wasn't alive at that point in time, but that, that had to be new to the music scene. And yeah, he, I think he, he, got the, he got that from Elvis's guitar player. I think one of the Elvis's guitar players, Scotty Moore, I think he mentioned. Okay. And he got that idea from. All right. That seems a bit weird, but, <laughs> but I, I mean, who knows what was in his mind. So, yeah, it might have been he, obvious to me. But... He started off in that era playing stuff like Elvis. He played with Jerry Lee Lewis and he played... So he, play, he was a rock and roll guitarist, he, although he's classically trained, he was a rock and roll guitarist, sort of first and foremost. And, that, and I think that definitely comes through in his, in his earlier Deep Purple Mark II stuff. And, and yeah, I remember what I wanted to, to comment on regarding the neoclassical movement and what he started is what I or the reason I always like his stuff is that he really did it with uh, with restraint or just just giving you just a small taste of that exotic eastern scales and uh, and sweeps and and arpeggios and that sort of stuff. But it wasn't overwhelming your ears, so it wasn't dumping on you like shredding all over in different positions because that can be too much, to me at least. Yeah. He always found the, the, or to me, he always found the exact right amount of, uh, of stuff to put into a song that still served the song, but it gave it a unique edge. Yeah, I mean, one of the lessons he taught me was, is sort of be like a method actor, where, you know, listen to the song, what it's about, and then, then, you know, when you play the solo, you, you're sort of getting a, a vibe for the song, if it's a sad song or blues or a hard rock song. And, you know, he, he would mess around with the melody. Um, and then, where, especially in the sort of more commercial stuff he did, and then he to the brrrr to show he could do it. But that's what made it exciting. It wasn't just like so It was just, you know, it was very... Um, uh, he'd, he'd mess around with the melody and then just build up and build up on that and then he'd start the fast flurry so he, he built the solo you know he didn't come in like a bull in a china shop exactly or I mean most of the times there, there are probably a few sol live solos that I like just because he broke this rule but 95% I totally agree, and this is a great lesson. This is how you, how you write a good song and, and a soul. And I mean, I never heard this method actor analogy, but it's, but it, but it's awesome. <laughs> that, that, that's yeah. Great. yeah, the two other really good lessons he taught me was if you're playing on stage and you make a mistake, look at the bass player and scowl. <laughs> so, so it's like, and everyone would turn around and look at the bass, Roger, and he'd be going, what? And, they, you know, so that, and he said, or he said, he said, if you're very good and very fast, if you make a mistake, do it six times in a row, and everyone thinks it's brilliant. It's like that, that whole thing with the... Yeah. You stay. Yeah. <laughs> so then, he, then he, he, he's quick, very... I mean, Richie is probably one of the most intelligent people I know. I mean, very, very great sense of humor, I mean, you know, people don't see that because they see the dark, moody image. But I, ne I never saw that side of him. I mean, he, he, was, he was incredibly funny. We had the same sense of humor, the Monty Python's mm -hmm. sense of humor. We, we could recite Monty Python's sketches. In fact, we, we did that once um, in his bar downstairs. And uh, I, I sort of walked downstairs into the bar. and He's behind the bar. And we did the, che the cheese shop sketch from Monty Python's. Do you know that one? I'm not sure. 
Well, they got the, the, the guy goes to buy some cheese and it, it, there's, it, he, he goes through every single cheese there is. There's thousands of different cheeses, you know, Venezuelan beaver cheese, blue emmental. And he goes through them all and he, the guy hasn't got any cheese at all. He's always making excuses. Oh, sorry, the van broke down. Oh, the cat ate it. And so I came, came into the, I, we, I think we filmed this. I've got it somewhere on video. And there was a few people around. And I came into the, walked into the bar, I said, uh, we did the sketch, but about beers. So mm-hmm. I'd say, um, uh, ah, good, I, I knew my good man, I'll have a Heineken, please. He says, oh, sorry, we're completely out. Normally say yes. And so we went on like this, and everyone was just in stitches. It was, it was so funny, but we had that same sense of humor. We had the same interest in sort of classical music whenever we'd travel anywhere, because Richie couldn't drive. He hadn't learned to drive. I mean, I... Yeah. I, I taught I taught him to drive in in his driveway in parking lots in 1984. Mm-hmm. He, he never learned to drive, but every time we drive, um, I put on uh, we we put on classical music and we'd go we'd have seances as well. That was something that uh, we had a big interest in doing. But that that's what kind of always struck me a bit weird. But it ties into this. I think to the, to, to the musical world that he was exploring with with Rainbow, for example, I can definitely definitely see the connection there. Yeah, well, one of the instrumental tracks is uh, called "Any Anybody There," yeah. and that's that's what we'd always say when we started the séance. We'd say, "Is there anybody there?" And that's where that came from. Uh, all right, it makes sense. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's awesome. So. So just based on the story, I, I kind of tried to, to put a timeline together. So you, so you met him in the 80s or late 70s or? But originally in the, late, in the late 70s. I mean, I was classically trained originally mm-hmm. from about eight years old and uh, really had no interest in rock music. And uh, my father was a jet fighter pilot in the Royal Air Force nice. in England. And... Uh, some people on the RAF base said, hey, we've got a spare ticket for this rock concert. Does your son want to go? And I was like, rock? No. My dad said, go on, give us some peace, get out of here. Mm-hmm. And I was 14. And I remember being, it's, I think it was around the time of in rock. And I was, we were right down the front. And I was, I was pretty bored all day because I was listening to these guitarists. And I went, well, you know, I never got the idea of, it, of artistic expression. You know, it was, for me, it, it was all classical technique and everything. I said, well, I can do that. Probably could because, because you know, I was classically trained. And then they, they announced the last, the last act, the headline, which was Deep Purple. Suddenly this guy dressed in black comes running to the front, just tearing off these amazing classical runs, speaking, they started with. And it was just like, he was, had so, so much volume and emotion and feeling and completely blew my mind. I was like, and that turned me on to rock and roll. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, I'd go to every concert I could and uh, just was com- a complete fan. And then at 19 years old, I met him. And we became best friends, which was really strange when you're ha- having dinner with the guy you've had posters of on your wall <laughs> all your life. Um, but, we, you know, he, you know he, as I said, he was, we, had, we had the same sense of humor both the interested in you know um esoteric things um classical music and uh and we play we soccer as well we we uh, you know play keeping fit and so you know it was some of the best years of my life that well that's a powerful story of of how he turned you into or on to rock and roll music from classical but I can, but I can see that. And did you, did you get into the other big names of the of the time, like Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath? After that, or oh yeah, yeah, I did. I you know Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, and Judas Priest, and and even some of the more yes, you know, the more progressive stuff and everything. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and I actually ended up playing with Keith Emerson. Nice. What what was that like? That was, that was amazing. I mean, you know, it's when you're playing with the musicians of that caliber, when, when I first moved out to the States, um, I got a band together and Richie would help us. 
he let us use his name on the radio. And so our first gigs were like to 2,000 seater clubs. And uh, I know they weren't there to see me, they were there to see Richie. Um, so, but I mean, we do our set and then we, when we finished, we'd go off and Richie would come on and uh, we'd do maybe six songs with him. And it was just an ama amazing experience. And I mean, you know, he really helped me with my career in those early days. Um, oh, incredibly nice of him. Yeah. And then uh, through uh, Richie, I met Cozy Powell. And then uh, Cozy had played with Keith Emerson. And then after a Jeff Beck concert, um, uh, Cozy and I, Cozy used to play with Jeff Beck. Mm -hmm. And he said, "Hey, let's go. Uh, let's go for over the, over the road and have a drink." So, Cozy and I went over the road, and Jeff Beck was at the hotel, which he'd arranged with Cozy. So I met Jeff, and uh, and then I was in L London at a club called Stringfellas, and I met and Cozy was in there with Keith Emerson when he joined at Emerson Lake and what became Emerson Lake and Powell, and I met Keith then, um, and we they invited me to their table, and we spent you know, a few hours chatting and then having a few drinks. And then uh, um, when I was in Los Angeles, I moved to Los Angeles, I was at the, uh, it was about 1994, something like, 95, something like that. I was at the House of Blues and I ran into Keith Emerson again. And uh, we were going to get Sweet back together to play um, with, with Steve Priest. Um, and he was getting Emerson, Lake and Palmer together. So we said, he came around my house afterwards and I was playing some classical. He said, hey, let's get a band together so we can warm up. So we put a band together called the Aliens of Extraordinary Ability, which was actually a category with immigration. Um, if you could do something, you're not taking a job away from an American. You, you, yeah. You're unique. You get what's called an Alien of Extraordinary Ability. We both had that status with immigration. So we call the band Aliens of Extraordinary Ability. And we'd, we'd, we'd play all over the place. It was great. And then Keith went on tour. I got the solo deal for the first Heaven and Earth album. And, uh, and that was it. But that was an amazing experience playing with Keith. I mean, I bet. You know, I've been very lucky. Yeah, I, I cannot even imagine, but, but it must have been amazing. Yeah. So, so you started, started out as a classically trained guitarist, and then I guess probably around 70 or 69, 70, 71, you, you saw Deep Purple and then that kind of turned you on to rock and roll. And you, at that point, were you still in, in school or, or how did you, how, how did music become your profession? That's, that, that's the ultimate question. Well, I, I, wanted, I wanted to be a jet fighter pilot like my father. I mean, I, I played and I, it was just something I was, I was naturally drawn to. Um, but my real love was being, you know, going flying, flying fighter jets and that kind of well, thing. I, I have to say, if there's like a hierarchy of jobs or dream jobs, rock star and jet fighter pilot must be around the, the upper echelon, around the same level. They, they are both... <laughs> so... Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what I wanted to do. And I went to college and then the RAF said, well, your grades are good enough. We'll, get, we'll take you on. And um, I, they, they gave me the, the medical and I'm, I'm red, green, colorblind. Mm. So I couldn't fly. Uh, I never knew because it didn't affect me. I, I could, 76% of all males are red, green, colorblind and don't even know it because I can tell red and green apart. I just can't pass the Ishihara cards, which are a circle of dots about this big. And in there, there's a number. So by the third page where there's an eight, I see a three. So oh. I only see half of it. So technically, I'm colorblind. But if I'm in a, a jet fighter cockpit, I can say that's a red light, that's a green light. But I can't pass this thing, which you need to be a fighter, uh, to fly anything. Yeah. So I then went and uh, worked for, I had a band. And then I went and worked for Texas Instruments uh, in um, in Bedford, where my parents had settled after my father left the Air Force. And uh, I worked for them for three months, learning to build and design computers. And then uh, I passed my probation. They said, uh, okay, we'll give you the company medical. I gave you the medical. They said, well, you're colorblind. I said, yeah, I, I put it on my resume. They said, well, we, we missed that. And said, you can't do this work by law because of the color coding on transistors and resistors and wires. So 
the, they, so I was getting really fed up with this by then, and they put me working under microscopes, um, uh, the, 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 just building semiconductors. And I quit at the end of the day, I'd had it. So I just, uh, I'd had one of those weeks you write about in blues songs where um, uh, my girlfriend had cleared off with my best friend, I'd crashed my car. I was arguing with my father a lot because we, he did, we were both confused. We didn't know what I was gonna do in life. Um, and just, uh, I, I just, you know, that, those very young year, teen years, I was just very lost. And uh, I walked into a bar and there was my ex-girlfriend with my ex-best friend and, uh, uh, and a band playing. And I had a, a rock band on the side and they were playing um, uh, jazz fusion, which was the popular thing there. And uh, so I just, uh, I, I walked in and they said something over the microphone and stopped, the song had just finished and they saw me walk in and they said, oh, here comes our three chord heavy riff merchant. And everything that I've been getting just building up inside me just snapped. And I just pushed everyone out of the way, got on, got on the stage, said, give me the fucking guitar. The guy, like an idiot, did. And so I said, good golly, Miss Molly, go. And they thought I was going to make a fool of myself. But I, I just literally, I was just tearing the neck off this thing, playing over the backwards over the neck, which no one did uh, those days. And just at the end of the thing, I just took the guitar off and, and got the drummer to roll, threw it in the air, caught it on the last beat, gave it back to him, said, follow that. Stormed off, sat at the back of the bar like this. All of a sudden, everyone's buying me drinks. There's a girl here, a girl there, a girl there. My ex-girlfriend came up and said, oh, you were so great. I said, you're lost. And so I, after that, I drove home um, and uh, I sat I parked in the hills above Bedford where I lived. And I just uh, um, just thought about it. And then I, three o'clock in the morning, I drove home, woke my dad up and said, I'm going to be a guitarist. And he just said, do it well. All right. So he was supportive. That's, yeah. that's great. Yeah. And so then I, I just put my heart and soul into being a professional guitarist and uh, ended up traveling all over the world through doing it. Well, that, that's an amazing story. I, I, I can practically see the movie as you were as you were telling the story that's just like just like a blues song so and did you did you meet blackmore via the, the touring or yeah it was, it's tour originally it was at a party after a after a, a concert and then we, we hit it off and then um it was him who actually persuaded me to move to the states because in england it's so it's so small that if you're not playing what's in fashion you sort of you starve and everything around the time of 83 was all dance music, Duran Duran and all that kind of thing. And uh, he came over with, um, with Joe Lynn Turner with Rainbow. And uh, I was just say, complaining about England. And he said, well, look, why don't you move to the States? He said, it's MTV's just starting. And so the and rocks in fashion there. He said, but it's so big that whatever you, music you're playing, there's always an audience. Yeah. Um, so I did, I moved over to the Long Island and he helped me um, with the band, getting it and playing with us and that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know why I was just very lucky. I mean, you know, he, at the, the time he had that very unapproachable, dark, moody image and I never saw that side of him. No. But perhaps it's the, it's the kinship, the sense of humor that you were just, just resonating with him. Probably, yeah. That's how you became friends, I guess. Yeah. And that's a great thing that happened. So. Yeah, I remember the first the first time I I really met him and spent some time with him. I said at the end as I'm leaving, I said it's a real pleasure meeting you, and he said I wish I could say the same, <laughs> which is you know. Yeah, classic British style. Yeah. Humor. <laughs> yeah. And I can definitely relate to, to what you said about the market being small. And it's, I mean, it's, it's even more true to Hungary than, uh, than the UK, because there's, I guess, there's like five bands in Hungary that can make real money. So I can definitely understand that. And this is one of the reasons I didn't pursue music professionally, because growing up in Hungary, there just wasn't 
wasn't viable in any way. Right. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess the UK is somewhat bigger, but, but yeah, whatever is in fashion and in, in the, uh, in the U S there's, there's a market for everything, which is, which is a great thing. Yeah. So that was, that was in the eighties and he helped you get the band together. And, uh, so the, and what, so, so what, what was the band then? Do I, or should we know it or? No, it was band. It was a band called Mirage. Originally I, when I came out, I brought the, the singer that I had, a guy called Kenny Stewart. Um, and he sort of, sort of gave up and went back to England. Mm. And, uh, I found people in Long Island. Um, no one that ever became noticeable. Um, I think the drummer, one of the drummers I had, eventually played with Richie for about five minutes and that didn't work out. But uh, um, that, that sort of got me the start. And then um, the, that band sort of had run its course and we, the, we had management problems, couldn't get it to the next level. And he was getting Deep Purple back together and he said, why don't you come on tour with me? So I did. And we went over to, uh, I was there during the recording of Perfect Strangers. Awesome. And, in, in Stowe, Vermont, uh, I flew up there and I stayed. They, they had the, the Horizons, which is this ski lodge where they had the mobile unit outside and they all had condos. Um, mm. The band had condos. And so I, I was staying with Richie in this condo. So it's an amazing time. They were all getting on well. And it was just a hell of an experience to see that. And uh, every night we'd go down the pub and play guitars play acoustics and John Lord would have an accordion and uh, that was a that was that was a lot of fun and that had to be a magical time yeah somewhat I guess it comes across the album Perfect Strangers I think you can just hear that the band is happy to to be together and, and play music yeah yeah, yeah. and the, there was touring was great and then we we uh we went on tour in Australia and on the way back, we stopped in Los Angeles and for a few days. And Richie introduced me to this girl uh, who I didn't want to go out on this blind date that he'd set up. Because I said, I know you. I, I know that <laughs> she's going to be a dog. And, uh, and I, I just know her. I thought, I'm going to, but, I, you know, I'd set myself up for it. So I got there and the girl turned out to be the penthouse pet of the year. Okay. Uh, and we got on, we hit it off really well. And uh, so I went back to uh, New York, to Long Island. She came out and visited me. And then I went back to England to do an album in 85, I think, end of 85. She came out with me. And then after that, we moved to Los Angeles. Um, and uh, that was 86. And I've been here ever since. Well, that's, that's when I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, what I kind of, the first thing that, that, that came to my mind when you said uh, you were there in, in Stowe, Vermont, there are some, I guess, crazy internet conspiracy theories about Blackmore maybe using Vox AC30 again in the, in the 80s. Do you know anything about that? Or was he just using his Marshall for that album or? No, he was using a Marshall Major. I mean, I, I know that 100%. Um, I believe that on Machine Head, he used a Mike Matthews Freedom amp. Um, mm, I'm not familiar with that. On Machine Head. It's, he's, it, I mean, most guitarists, they have a very distorted sound. Richie's sound is incredibly clean. Exactly. And the Marshall Majors, you've got to, to get anything out of them, you've got to turn them up so loud. So Richie uses the tape recorder to overdrive them. Yeah. But just a little, it's still, he's still incredibly clean. Um, you know, and when I was in uh, um, Long Island and I had the band there, Richie lent me an amp to practice in my, and I think it was the Mike, Mike Matthews Freedom, um, just a single 12 inch speaker and that. But uh, I, I don't know if he was, I know that what he did with the Marshall Majors is he went to Marshall and he had the engineers there replace the preamp stage with a Vox AC30 preamp stage yeah. um, to overdrive the Marshall Majors, which you had to because they were so loud otherwise. 
So, um, uh, he, uh, yeah, but for, for perfect strangers, he definitely used a Marshall major with, uh, the four by 12. Mm, that, that, that's what I was what think, thinking as well. And, well, this is something I guess no one will <laughs> ever know. Probably he doesn't remember either, but, but from what I can tell, he was, he, his amps were always modded pretty much. Yeah, they were souped up. They, they were, they were, they were souped up and then mainly through the preamp stage. Um, where he had the, this, the, the replaced it with the, uh, the Fox AC30 preamp mm -hmm. stage in the Marshall Major. And then he'd overdrive it. Later on, he'd overdrive it with a tape recorder. Yeah, yeah. And to me, like you said, Blackmore was way cleaner than, than anyone else. But, but behind that cleanliness or with that cleanliness, the, the sound was also very fat. So listening, and that, that's one of the most unique features, I think. And this is why I really like his tone from Machine Head to, well, I think throughout the 70s, maybe in the 80s, it was, it was a bit different, but, but it was always way more clean than you thought and fat, full of balls, not just, not just that thin, distorted that you can. Well, the, the, the cleaner you can play, um, the bigger it sounds. I mean, that's why these these guys playing the old rock and roll with sort of the uh, clean, clean sound of that, they sound huge in comparison to these guys. That are yeah, that kind of exactly. And that's, the, that, that's one of the best tales that what you just played. On Blackmore's guitar tones, he was able to play cowboy chords, open chords, and they sounded nice. If you crank up a newer Marshall, like a JCM 800 or something like that, and you try that, that will sound like just, just like a sort of thing. Yeah. The strings don't ring out nicely with, with an open chord. Yeah. So that, that's a good tell. As long as we are we're talking about gear and amps, I'm guessing you played a lot on his guitar or, or strats or... Oh yeah, yeah. He gave me the strat he used to do Stone Cold. And it was in the Stone Cold video and the Death Alley Driver. He gave me that for my 28th oh, okay. birthday. Um, and, uh, but Richie, uh, he scallops the necks like, uh, um, it's on an angle, it's like this. So it's scalloped across like that. Mm -hmm. So it really only affects the top three strings. Um, and, uh, because uh, otherwise, if you have it on the on the bass strings, it, it tends to pull it out of tune. Yeah. And I, I was playing one of his guitars. I thought, this is incredible. So we, we sat around his kitchen table and he got the file out and did it to mine. So <laughs> uh, it's, uh, and it was funny. I, th there's just so many little, just talking about things like that. There's little, little memories. I was there every, every, when I moved to Los Angeles, every Christmas I'd fly out and stay with him for Christmas. And I was, uh, uh, I sat in the uh, in the kitchen eating breakfast or something, and he's wandering through the house playing an acoustic, and he just did this amazing run, and uh, and I just said, "How did you do that?" And he just looks at me that sideways glance like that, and said, "Practice." Walked off. <laughs> but um, you know, it's uh, um, where were we? <laughs> We're scalloping. Yeah, scalloping. So I, I anyway, so I, I, I liked it so much, the feel of it and everything, because you could really get that sort of... You know, that deep vibrato. Um, yeah. And Richie's not like other guitarists, where they, you have so you, like Dave Gilmore, sort of like... <laughs> He's got that very slow vibrato, um, which a lot of guitarists, they have one style of vibrato. Richie's sometimes like... <laughs> or sometimes like... You know, he's got... He mixes the vibrato up, and also the pickups. So he plays a lot on the bass pickup, the, the neck pickup. <laughs> and then he'll flick the pickup. He'll flick the pickup, and so that last note screams. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's... I love doing that. But anytime I'm, I'm recording something, and I'm, obviously I'm, I'm only doing it on an amateur level, but uh, any studio engineer 
always tells me to to cut it out. Don't 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 switch the pickup. And and I no no no, you don't understand. That's that's a stylistic choice. It sounds better yeah. that way. No, you have to select the pickup and play on that one throughout the solo. No 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 no, no. that's that's way more. I yeah, I mean, one of the most amazing solos he ever did, in my opinion. I mean, it, it, everything he's done is, pretty, I mean, pretty much everything he's done is brilliant. But um, one of the uh, the most amazing, especially how he was very young when he did it, lazy on mm. machine. That that's not worked out. He's just blowing. He's just, and it, it's and he plays the whole thing, the whole the whole solo on the bass pickup. Um, yeah, you know, that makes uh, sense. Yeah, he, the whole solo is on the on the on the neck pickup, and it's just it's still to this day just f uh, f there's no one of that age can pull off shit like that. Yeah, well, I can't even pull off pull off lazy right now. Or <laughs> so, so and talking about lazy, most people when they play it, they they get it wrong because they're playing it like they flatten their fingers like this so let me get it over so you can see a bit it's that's not how he plays it to get that swing to it you've got to bounce off things like you know, he's playing with the tips of his fingers he's not flattening his, his flattening his fingers to do that um, which is you know it's you have to really have a good technique to do that because you're switching between strings um, and that. Uh... Well, that's definitely one of the challenges of the riff. And uh, well, from, from the solo, what I, what I was never 100% sure, the, the third section, the last section, when he does it. That sort of thing, I'm, I'm not mildly person sure what it is. But that's one of the hardest things to figure out. Did he play it in this position or... Because to me, I don't know, because I wasn't there, but I, I, I played it uh, sort of a... That's where I play it. I mean, Richie yeah. might have done it like you. I mean, but I mean, the, the, just the, the the sheer brilliance of that solo is that what he's not. He didn't think about this. He just he just was blowing. Yeah. And it's so jazzy and stylistic, and still one of my favorite solos to this day. Oh, it definitely is. It has to be in the top for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, and even at the beginning, that's. The beginning is just very, it's on the bass pickup. Switch is over. You know, it's yeah. that switching of the pickups, that's the only time he went to the treble pickup. I mean, the rest of the time he's doing it on the neck pickup. And it was, you know, he, he did a lot of the solos on Machine Head on that, uh, on that, that, I think in Pictures of Home, everything on the, is on the, uh, the main riff until he goes diddly, diddly, diddly. that's when he flicks that pickup hmm. or you know, in smoke on the water yeah. that. <laughs> it's, it's actually it's, it's on the whole solo on the bass pickup and then he gets to the thing when he uh, does that uh... <laughs> you know, th that's so effective that's yeah. that's flicking the pickups. Um, it's and unless you're playing with a very clean sound, it's very hard to to get um, it, it to come through on when you're recording uh, if you're playing on the bass pickup, um, which is it's always a temptation to have it on the the, the treble pickup, uh, the the bridge pickup because it's it's easier to get sustain and everything else. Mm. But if you can click play with a clean sound that's when it it just sounds great that's probably something i'm i'm guilty of is, is I'm, I'm probably using more bridge pickup than i should and uh so, so thank you for for mentioning that that's that's a good lesson to keep in mind 
Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's all down to personal choice. I mean, I I don't think guitarists use the, the pickups enough. They they sort of have maybe have one for rhythm and one for lead. Yeah. Um, whereas. And nowadays, every, everybody's just using pedals, and then they forget about the knobs, the pickups. So you can get a lot done with just those. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I just generally use an, an echo. I have it set like Richie does, which is... Mm -hmm. Just dum, 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 dum. About four repeats and just dying off. Um, that's about all I use. Occasionally, I'll use an octave divider um, or mm -hmm. a, um, a Morley Wah Wah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's about it, really. You know, I, everything else I control from the guitar. And what amp are you using? A Marshall 50 watt, which is uh, Howard Lease from Heart gave me, and it's uh, it's a Lee, ja Lee Jackson mod, so it's it's very s sustainy. And I've got the Marshall Major, um, which is super, one of the souped up, which is souped up ones. So I've got the Marshall Major, and in the past I've used this amp that I got from Howard, and uh, it's red. And so what I do is when I play live, uh, even when I record, I have them pan. I don't have them pan it like this. I have them pan it exactly to where. So you get the sustain from the, uh, the, the 50 watt and cracked up, but you also get the, 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 clean, the clean sound of the, um, of the Marshall Major. Um, and then just recently, I've started using the Engel amps. Um, uh, they, they sort of the one that Richie designed with them. Uh, I just uh, the, the, that's what I'm using now. Well, did he ever use his signature series? Because it kind of seemed to me that he was always using that sovereign combo, or that that's what I always saw on Blackmore's night shows. Yeah, no, uh, he used the signature series when he was with Deep Purple, um, and then I think with uh, with Rainbow. Um, after that, but then we went to the combos really for Blackmore's Night and just stuck with those. Yeah, and and they sound awesome. I have a small angle combo, a Screamer 50, but and I'm thinking about changing the speaker because I just I just don't find the the bass or the bottom in it, so I'm just lacking the fatness. But other than that, I think those are great amps. I was with Richie once and someone said, oh, I worked out that, uh, that run in Flight of the Rat and uh, he did it originally how you did it. And Richie said, that's a lot of work. <laughs> and it, 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 he was just a... It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just hammer-ons. And, uh, and you can hear it if you listen closely, you can hear the... He's got that open string thing going. Well, after you mentioned it, I was definitely able to hear it. But I, I guess I have my own biases. <laughs> and yeah, 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 yeah. Every, 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 music's subjective, so you can always play anything, you know, however fits your, your technique. You've got a good stretch, so... Um, yeah, that's... Well, I'm not even sure how, how I got to that. But to me, but I, but I, I've seen I've seen Blackmore a couple of times live with with Blackmore side, but mostly from from TV shows or or concert videos. It seems to me that that he has big hands or long fingers or. No, not really. The same as mine. All right. Um, no, he, um, they just look long because he's he's skinny and they were yeah. and moving fast. All right. But. Uh, yeah, I mean, he—he's a very economical player. I mean, he when I, I didn't when I said to you, uh, he doesn't want to do that much work. It's not like he's lazy. It's just that he's a very hard worker when it comes to music. Always has been. Um, but even to, with the uh, when we we'd uh, do those shows together, he would come and rehearse with us, um, mm -hmm. which is you know amazing experience. I've still got some bit cassettes of that. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, he's a very economical player because he's got the technique, so he 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 can get between 
notes as opposed to having to stretch out for it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, economically, it's probably the, the best way of putting it. I didn't necessarily mean lazy as, as a poor work ethic because I think it shows that, that, that he's really diligent. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, just economical, yeah, comfortable. Yeah. That, that's what he's, he's, got, he's got an amazing ear as well. I mean, just mm -hmm. we, we'd sit there and just play and um, one of the greatest, greatest lessons I had with him was uh, when I uh, started going out there for Christmas, um, walks into the, the, my bedroom with an acoustic and he's got an acoustic, said, right, let's learn some Christmas carols. And yet with those, you're changing a chord like that. And, you know, with the, nearly every syllable. And so it's incredible, um, uh, good exercise to, to play these things. And so we, we practiced them and then we had the big Christmas party, which Richie had always liked to turn up at his own party. So he'd say, come on, let's go out for dinner. And people would come and there's like just one person in the house, the party would get going. And when we'd come back from dinner and there'd, there'd be the, the party going on. And then but we'd, get behind, we'd sit behind the bar and play Christmas carols together. And uh, sometimes we'd have uh, carolers come in or just uh, once Joe Lynn Turner, when he was with Rainbow, did it. And, and uh, as well uh, with Ian Gillen up in uh, Stowe, it was just, it, they're just fun to play. And Richie, he, he, he was at the stage where he was being able to finger pick it and pick the bass line and the melody. And <laughs> I'm just bashing away at chords. <laughs> yeah, even in some, in some early Rainbow, Rainbow Shoes, you can hear him doing some Chad Atkins stuff. That sort of thumb band. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that, that's sort of what always fascinated me with Deeper Plan Rainbow, that they always seem to me like guys who just really love music and they, they, they play music even when they are not on stage. And I think they yeah. just... That must have been great to just just leave all these not show or not public moments, just just private musical yeah. experiences with them. That must have been the best thing ever. Yeah, I mean, I I play all the time. I, I just love playing. I mean, I'll never stop. Um, I mean, one of the ways what I, I'll do is I'll I'll put the television on, and I'll I'll. I'll just have the guitar at low volume and I'll play along with the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got the thing going on like... Uh, so. <laughs> somewhere along the way, I'll, I'll go, um, I'll hear something and I'll just be jamming on it and I'll go, oh, that's cool. So I'll stop the, stop the television show and I'll get my iPhone and I'll record... 30 seconds of it. And that's how I get my ideas because uh, I'll just, I'll, or I'll just be playing and I'll just I'll come up with something. I'll go, that's, that's really cool. And uh, I'll just record 30 seconds of it. And then like when we, we got together, there's Lynn uh, Sorensen, our bass player, who used to be with Bad Company, um, oh. Simon Wright and I, and when we did this last album, we, we were here and um, I would, I'd get my iPhone, I'd play a riff and they'd go, the guys are going, yeah, next riff, yeah, next riff, ah, that one. So we just start jamming on it and, and everybody would um, join in and then someone would take it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's how we'd write the songs. Right, and that would have been one of my questions. I, I was interested about, that, interested about that. So that's good that you brought it up. Yeah. And... Uh, what did you learn from, from Blackmore about, about songwriting other than serving the song? You know, I, I learned a lot about, but certainly from Richie was the, the magic of a good riff. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, having a, a, good, a good riff come along. Um, okay. I mean, also, I mean, you steal a lot of stuff. It's like Richie said, Richie said, it's like a good artist copies, a great artist steals. But you've got, uh, that's, that's Gershwin's fascinating rhythm. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and uh, so Richie heard that and he just rocked it up. So one of the things I really learned from him, the power of a great catchy riff and it, the simplicity as well. It's if you try and do one of these, um, you know, on the Dig album, I did one. Sort of, uh, I can't remember it now. Uh, yeah. Exciting riff to play, and it was a lot of fun, but no one can remember it. You know, it's not like you know exactly. that you're gonna re it's it's four notes. Exactly. It, it's so it's simplicity. I, I, I strive for it, but it's it's not easy. It's not easy to write a, a, a thing, and so that's one of the things that I really learned from him. Is is the power of a good riff, and mm -hmm. for for stuff that's uh, playing popular songs, um, pop songs, that generally you'll find that there's a, a lot of good chord progressions in them, um, yeah. and uh, yeah, I mean one of Richie's favorites was ABBA. He used yeah, to play that. He'd play it consistently. I mean, uh, uh, the parties, uh, they'd be just ABBA on it. Richie, let's put something else on it. Never any rock music. It's like... <laughs> but I, I can definitely relate to that because I don't listen to that much rock music as either. So, or, yeah. Anyway, so, so I can kind of, I can kind of relate to that. But to, to kind of disagree with your earlier point, I did remember that that was Rock and Roll Does from the Dig album. And yeah. I kind of I kind of remember that Rick because it's sort of like like a Black Morris solo kind of lick converted into a, into a, a riff. Yeah. And like I I I enjoy that but but I definitely understand what you mean about but getting something uh, that's not that complicated, but uh, memorable. Part of a good hook. Just yeah, that's and that's that's the, that's that's the trick, and it's not easy. It's really not easy to come up with something simple that that people can remember. I mean, I always tend to get mired in my own stuff. You know, bogged down with it. I'm like the, on the big album. <laughs> it's very interesting riff to play and it's interesting very eastern and everything else but it's it's not one that is appealing to the ear as something as simple as you know uh rock you like a hurricane by the scorpions yeah. da -da -da -da, da -da -da, you know yeah <laughs> but like a lot of fun to play you know for sure and this is what I said earlier, that, that Blackmore always found a really tasteful way of putting in some sophistication or some classical elements. And Burn, the Reef of Burn was also a great example of, from your part because I think there just, just has to be one of the biggest rock and roll riffs. I would argue it's better than Smoke on the Water, but that's subjective, so no point in arguing about that. But I kind of feel that it, it I wouldn't really say it's stealing because in the context of Gershwin's playing on the piano just as like a verse theme or, or not a main theme, I think it was totally different and Blackmore really rocked it up and put it in the spotlight and used it in a very different context, even though there are obviously similarities between the two, but repurposed it or, yeah. Yeah, and that's the magic. I mean, that's the genius to take a riff that, I mean, I've got a little acoustic band at the moment because there's no touring for us because of COVID. Um, they, they, we, can't, we really need to tour in Europe where the big festivals are, but they open up, they close down because the promoters have to play a third of the money um, to the bands. And if they close it down, they lose a fortune. So um, we don't know what's going on there. But I put a little um, uh, acoustic thing together with some friends of mine. I've got a friend of mine playing uh, acoustic 12 string. I'm playing acoustic, my tailor, and uh, my acoustic bass player. I've got Marvin Sperling, who was with me in The Aliens of Extraordinary Ability with Keith Emerson. I've got a percussionist and this girl singer. And uh, one, of, one of the songs, we're, we're doing these classic rock songs and like More Than a Feeling, Boston, and, and this mm -hmm. kind of thing. 
Um, and one of the songs that I, I said, look, we'll try this. And we did Britney Spears, Hit Me Baby, one more time. But it's like... It's... <laughs> It's a great song, and it's funny at the stuff that Simon Wright's uh, um, uh, Halloween party. We got the acoustic out because we know just me and the girl singer there. We got and we started and we did that song, and people went just crazy. It's simple. It's remember it, and it's just. But it's we we've rocked it out, and that's the genius that Richie had. He get a song. Even Smoke on the Water was something from something called Maria Choir. Um, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, and but that's it was a jazz song, and that's what what you know the genius of it was is that he could take a, a popular riff. So it's a trick because people have heard it before. He, growing up, their parents played it and everything else, and they can't quite put their finger unless you have that knowledge. Yeah. You, you can't quite put your finger on where oh that's that's I, that's and you you don't forget it like burn. Smoke in the Water. It's, they were just things that people had heard. And, uh, you know, one of the other things, just going back to a point, which um, most of the guitarists today grew up on people like uh, Pete Townsend, Richie Blackmore, Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page, Eric Clapton. Um, those guys grew up on guys like uh, James Burton, Scotty Moore, um, all these really amazing guitarists with people like Elvis and that kind of thing. They grew up play, playing that. So they firstly grew up having a, a clean sound because the amps in those days didn't, they did, you didn't, there was no way to overdrive them. Um, so he play, they, they'd play with his, get used to playing with a clean sound. And also to make that interesting, they create their own vibratos. Um, whereas the, the guitarists of, Later on, they listened to people like who'd already created that sound, but they 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 added the distortion and everything else. Yeah, and I think a lot of people doesn't necessarily know that James Burton was one of the first guys who who really went into string bending. And, yeah, and then string bending became a main became a main mainstay. Also that. And, uh, Yeah. That's kind of their country licks a lot. Of, yeah, they're, they're sort of like. You know what? And, and that's something <laughs> I, want, I wanted to ask you that at some point he must have to listen to country because it appears to me that at some points he does some chicken picking licks like. <laughs> Well, during the when Richie first started, he was a session guitarist. So he would uh, play with uh, uh, the band, the people like Jerry Lee Lewis. They'd come into to play in England, and they wouldn't bring the whole band over. They just hire they, the yeah. promoter would hire musicians there. And Richie was one of those top guys. Um, so he got used to he he had a great ear, and he got used to playing these um, uh, country licks. I mean. Chet Atkins type licks and that kind of thing. And, and, and he then, in just some small nuggets, he kind of inserted in his, his source. For yeah. example, I, I think in, in Space Fucking, he has that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, that's that's again just another hard one to understand from the. But you have to listen closely, and and yeah. Uh, one of, I think, what makes it kind of difficult to to hear this, in many cases, or for example, in with, with the early Rainbow stuff for Lonely Rock and Roll, there are some harmonies in there, and the mixing is. It's definitely great, but doesn't help you as a transcriber or someone who wants to pick it up by ear. Sometimes you, you don't necessarily hear what the guitar is playing, and that's that's how you can misunderstand things or, or, or things or just your brain just fills it up differently. 
So I think those are some of the challenges that I face when I try to learn Blackmore. Sometimes the mix doesn't help me honing on the guitar or zeroing on the guitar. Yeah, Richie, I mean, Richie, I don't, I, I, I don't know if Richie plans it out uh, because, I mean, sometimes he's doing the third, sometimes the fifth, sometimes the seventh, sometimes the tonic. And that's like Highway Star is all over the place. Yeah. So it's, but, and the same with a lot of his, his harmonies. They're not straight harmonies where, um, you know, the, the obvious. He, he'll mix them up, which makes it so interesting. And this is why, to this day, I'm not sure what are the harmonies for Highway Star are. <laughs> I always give it a shot. I always try to, to, to figure it out, but I always like, mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I got it. So, oh, yeah. I asked, I asked him once he went, I don't know. <laughs> he, just, exactly. he, just, he just did what felt natural to him. Yeah. Uh, Howard Lees has got a great ear. He worked, we had a little uh, um, sort of band we were putting together and uh, we were doing that song and Howard, Howard worked out this, the harmony. I was like blown away that he actually got it. But he, he's got an amazing ear, that kind of stuff. And that's one of the most important things that people often, uh, often neglect. I always try to tell anyone when we are talking about guitar playing that use your ears. That's, and I know I, my YouTube channel is full of tabs. Uh, I'm kind of maybe guilty of, of making people lazy <laughs> or, or convenient, but you have to use your, your ears because that's, that's a prime medium for music. So that's, or at least today. Obviously, if you want to learn Mozart, you gotta read the chart, but if you wanna learn Blackmore, you have to listen. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's probably how they learn as well. Yeah. I think we were talking a lot about vibrato and touch and that sort of to what, well, unique skills or what makes a guitar player unique. And I wanted to ask you, what is your take on the age old question? Is stone in the hands or, I mean, it's obviously not a binary question either in the hand or either in the, in the gear. There's obviously a ratio. What do you think? I, I, I asked Roger Glover that, that cause I thought, I thought the solo on, uh, when, uh, I was at Roger Glover's house and, um, I was, we we're talking about the solo on I surrender mm -hmm. and, and at the end. And I said, mm. Roger, I said, Roger, what, what effect are you putting? It sounds like the guitar is really singing. And he said, I didn't put any effect on it. He said, the sound comes from within. Mm -hmm. it, it comes from inside. And it, it took me years to really understand how wise that statement was. Because it's like Richie, I mean, I've heard him play on a, a Gibson, you know, through a, a, some completely different amp. And he sounds just like Richie, you know, it's... Yeah. And, for me, are the same. I, I, I play on a Gibson, and uh, I'm still going to sound like me. It's the sound. It was a great lesson that Roger taught me. The sound comes from within. It's not I your gear. And I definitely agree. And, and like, like I said earlier, vibrato is one of the manifestations of this, I think. Obviously, no choice as well. And uh, Vibrato kind of brings me back to, to scalloping because you were saying that Blackmore had his, his sort of diagonal or I yeah. know, the right word, yeah. I kind of have something similar on my Blackmore signature Fender, but, but on this one, I kind of had a Malmsteen style, kind of deep bumps or kind of done. And I definitely feel that it's a better idea to have it just for the lower strings because you can you can be more assertive with your riffing. Yeah, that's true. I mean, Richie originally did it like that, but then he he worked out that it, it was pulling it out of tune a lot yeah. on the bass things, and you could be like you said more assertive with the the uh, bass things. And really, he needed it for the vibrato, which is was main, mainly for the top three strings. Well, I definitely can can understand that. For example, I have trouble playing like big bands like Highway Star on a not or a not scale of neck because I kind of am 
pushing directly below the string. So I'm not, not putting my hands down on the string and then pushing it up like you would do on a normal guitar. But because because of there's there's no wood under the string there. I can just yeah. One of the things that with that Tommy starts playing, he's using his little finger oh. here. But what he does is he has is the finger, the third finger behind it. So you got the pressure of two there. That's. But what's one of the things that Big Jim Sullivan taught him very early on is to use your little finger. Yeah. Because that's where, that's where you get your speed from. Uh, and it, but I just don't bend with my, just for some reason I can't, I never bend. Yeah, you, you, put, you put the third to... finger, you put the third finger behind it. So. <laughs> I'm gonna work on that. That's that's very good that you. Yeah, but just putting this finger behind it, you're getting yeah. the pressure of two fingers. But you can always take this one off to get the note behind it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have to try that. Alright, you know that might not be. As hard as I thought, but I but I will have to work on that for sure. <laughs> and it it kind of neatly ties into one of the main topics I, I wanted to ask you, and that's picking. So a riff or like an arpeggiated stuff like Highway Star. Would he alternate picking or like up and down? Or it, it generally it's it's up and down. It's a. Uh... It's like that, that, that fly the rat thing. It's again, he's a very economical player. It's very intelligent playing. So everything like that is, 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 is if, you, if you pitch down, the next one should be up. Yeah. Unless, unless, unless you're doing like a, a like, like, you know, a descending type. Uh, that he does that. It just upstrokes, right? Yeah, but that, but generally, I mean, you listen to the beginning of Highway Star. He's going, you know, it's all up and down. Yeah, yeah, and and does he do that with, I guess, burn? You see. Yeah. When we're doing that, all right. That's because that's a big revelation for me. I, I always kind of played like like burn. I always did it like. Down. I guess you can't see my. So sort of like a sweep between the B and the G strings, but it's really counterintuitive in a way because I start in the opposite direction that I want to go because sweepers usually just, just do one direction but I can yeah, you... come back but it doesn't yeah you can tell you can tell with the clarity of it it's he's picking up and down it's like uh... yeah mm -hmm. exactly it has it is a, a more even and stronger attack than just yeah yeah so that's something I'm working on right now to to be able to comfortably do that because that's just weird for me after so many years not doing that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just constantly growing. I mean, uh, there's uh, things that I, I I'll find, I'll just be listening on to television. I thought, oh, that's cool riff, and I'll just I'll try and work it out. Even yeah. if it's, especially if it's uncharted territory for me, you just grow that way. You also asked about keeping the guitar in tune. I have a I have the tremolo floating, so yeah. it goes up, up and down. But I have a here. These are Graf Tech um, uh, saddles, mm -hmm. so they have 
they have gra graphite which they release and it's like oil for you know tiny molecules of graphite same for the uh, nut i have a graphite uh, nut i have locking machine heads mm -hmm. richie doesn't have locking machine heads um i don't think he has, does anything special with the nut either um but he has them just very well balanced and one of my guitars i changed it to a graph tech like teflon or graphite i'm not sure which one but it helps sliding but my nut is not changed but i just had these locking tuners put up on this so yeah. that, that definitely helps a lot yeah and I, I was surprised how how much it helped my other guitar which is actually in for repair at the moment is the uh the aero 3 which is that signature model they made for me oh and that's being repaired at the moment otherwise i normally play that and and the one that you have in your hand is it like a, a vintage strat or it's a 78 okay but, uh... <laughs> Yeah, so it stays in tune pretty well. But also, the uh, straps, as I got this from Richie, he countersinks them. Mm -hmm. That was a good idea. That, that's the only guitar he gave me, the one he did Stone Cold on. And uh, so I did all my guitars because I was fed up with them breaking off. Mm. So what happened to that guitar that he, he gave you, the, the Stone Cold guitar? Oh, unfortunately, uh, I had to sell it. Oh. Um, but I'm working on now to possibly buy it back. Mm, that, yeah. would be, that would be awesome. Yeah. And I think that looked just like this, right? Natural. Yeah, except, yeah it, it, it did, except it was a white scratch mm -hmm. plate. Yeah. yeah. And you're not using the middle pickup either, right? I don't, I don't have one. I take it out oh, yeah. completely. Um, yeah, just, it, it just it gets in my way and I never use it. It's either, for me, it's either, you know. <laughs> yeah, but what I have on this one is, I have a little in there, but it's not one. So I kind of have the desk sort of thing that's kind of... For example, if I do like... Yeah, I have, I have the middle section pickup, pick I have both pickups. Mm -hmm. So this is the, tre the treble. <laughs> Although I never use that sound. Um, except, except when that's not true. If I'm recording and I, the and uh, like Lynn Sorensen, our bass player, he he was produced the last album. He said, uh, uh, you know, double the guitar. I'll I'll do it on a di maybe use a different guitar and I'll do it on say the middle pickup, so it's a completely different sound. So you get that sort of yeah. you're not stepping on the same frequencies. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, do you have? Any idea, or did you ever talk to Blackmore about why he wasn't using tellies, telecasters? I don't know. He used the uh, um, the three three five, and then yeah. one of Eric Clapton gave him a strap, and he just liked it. I, I, one of the things I was Richie and I were talking about was um, just the difference between Gibsons and Strats. Um, you can get a backing track say just a backing track, say rock and roll song or blues song, and you can have all different guitarists playing Gibsons on it. But if you don't know the song, you can't really, it's very hard to tell who's who. Mm -hmm. If you have the same track and everyone's playing Strats, you can go, that's Dave Gilmore, that's Richie Blackmore, that's Jimi Hendrix, that's Mark Knopfler. Yeah. Strats tend to, because the, the, the amount of work you have to do with a Strat, the yeah. Gibson is very easy to play a Strat, you're working with the radius for one thing on the neck. It has a curve here, so you're bending the string to a sort of the point beyond there. And when you pull, when you bend the string, you pull the. Uh, the if you've got the floating tremolo, you pull those out of tune. So you have to do it by. You have to do it by ear. You have to really. Uh, it's it's you bend like Gibson. You bend up 
this much, and that'll be the note. With a okay. strap, you have to bend a bit, a bit more because the, the tension will go. And you also have the reverb, which is created by the springs in the back here. Um, Tell about that. Yeah, so that's a natural reverb. That so you, you could, you know, Richie and I were talking one night, and I just said, look, you put all these guitar players, and you you don't know you don't know the song, but you can instantly go. You know, that's Dave Gilmore, that's you, that's Hendrix, that's so, you know. Yeah. You can't do that with Gibsons. It doesn't bring out the individuality of a player, in my opinion. No, I can, I can see that. But what my experience is, when, when, I, when I was playing live, obviously now because of COVID, I, I don't either, but when I were, um, I mainly use the telly because it was a country band. But sometimes I use my 335. A Gibson, and what I what I notice is I immediately disappear from the mix when I get a Gibson with the humbuckers. But, right. But if I get my telly, I'm cutting through. Everyone can hear me. Oh, te telly will cut through everything. Yeah, exactly. The strut, not so much, but 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 way way better. Yeah, yeah. I know Richie has he had a telecast. I've never really seen him play one though. Um, He's, he's not one of these guitarists that will go into the studio with 10 different guitars. He takes his yeah. one favorite and that's it. Yeah, he didn't really have, I mean, I guess I saw a lot of photos from the, from the 70s having a lot of strats, but after the, the 70s, so from the 80s onwards, you kind of just see those two guitars, those two white ones that he was kind of switching between. Oh yeah, yeah. But there's, it's that, that's, that's the search for the magic riff, you know, the, 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 the simple but powerful riff. And it's, like I said, it's not easy. No, it's definitely not. And it's even harder coming up with something that Blackmore haven't written yet. <laughs> because all those, all those great riff, riffs like Man on the Silver Mountain, Smoke on the Water, All Night Long, Spotlight Kid, those are already written. And if you want to write something like that, it's super hard to get close to that feeling, but not copying, but not copying one of those. Oh yeah, like... Very simple. Exactly, exactly. I always kind of liked it, but to me, To me, somehow, by the end, because I don't want to say anything bad about ACDC, that's, that's not about that, but just with some bands, and ACDC would be an example for that, I kind of felt, or kind of feel when I'm listening to them, that it's maybe staying easy all the way throughout. But with Rainbow or Purple, I kind of feel that it always starts out simple, but then it gets turned around in a way that you wouldn't expect and there's oh yeah, twisty. yeah. Well, that's the trick. I mean, that, that that Richie had, which was to have a very simple riff, but then do something incredible during the verses. I mean, um, and, and I think that's that's not 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 even just true for for riffs, but but any arpeggios like Kill the King or Burn. If you want to write something like that, and most Deep Purple cover bands who do original songs try doing that. But to me, they always just fell short. They always kind of just, just, just miss a bit. But anytime I tried to write something like that, I always come up with nothing that's that's worthwhile doing. So I rather just not do, I just don't do it. Yeah, I mean, ACDC are, are the masters of that as well. For like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just. And which kind of bring, brings me to one topic I, I haven't talked about yet, groove or rhythm. And ACDC is a great example of that, that they are just dialed into the pocket 100% and that really yeah. sells everything they do. And I think that, and let me know if you agree, that's probably one of the best qualities as a musician that Blackmore has is his impeccable rhythmic feel or just oh, his, his timing is like a metronome i've never known anyone any other musician i've met who's got his timing as good as him he's 
It's like a metronome. Yeah. Yeah. And it's good, but playing with him as well is really amazing because he, he sort of pushes the beat a bit, but it's still, it's constant. It's mm -hmm. constant. And it, when you play with him, it locks you in mm -hmm. because it's so powerful. Yeah. Well, I can only imagine, but how it is to play like beat him. But uh, yes, as, yeah, there's just one thing that as it's getting later and later, my English speaking abilities are declining <laughs> <laughs> by the minute. Yeah, I mean, I never, I never really got into the cover band thing. I mean, I've played original since I first started playing guitar. But I love, I love covering a good song. Um, you know, it's when we, when we did, when we toured with Heaven and Earth, uh, we'd stick in Lazy Speaking, um, Mr. Big by Free. That was a, a fun song to play. Richie was the same as well. He, he really d didn't mind doing a cover. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know he always tried to get the guys in Deep Purple to do that, but they didn't want to. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can kind of see that too, but but just from the mere fact that 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 Blackmore really like Abba, I think that's that's just a good way of demonstrating that he just loved the music. He just liked good songs. Yeah, it doesn't have to be rock and roll. You can like other things if they are good. I mean, I love touring. I, the recording process gets a bit boring for me, but a touring, because I've been recording from the moment you actually come up with an idea for a song to building it up and working it up with a band and then recording it, you've heard it about 500 times. Yeah. But live, yeah, I mean, I love the traveling, seeing different places, meeting the people out there, um, and, uh, and also just making, playing, you're playing the same songs every night, but you know, trying to make it different every time. And to the point where you get so comfortable, you're just jamming on the song. Exactly. And, and this, is, this is why I always bring up Blackmore and Deep Purple, because it, it seemed to me listening to different concert footages or, or just recordings made in Japan, for example, the Three Nights, they are playing songs differently. They're improvising very different things. And this is something that that many bands doesn't really do. For example, I saw Queen with Paul Rogers like 10 years ago, and I really liked Brian May, but he really played it safe at that show. So most of what he soloed was very close to the record, the original recording. And I kind of felt that I already heard this. I came to the show to, to, to listen to what you think of this song right now. What are you in the mood for? And I think that's what Blackmore and Joel Lord and all those guys were masters of. Oh yeah, I mean, Richie would never do the solo the same, the solo the same. He he knew the the hook lines. I mean, he knew knew that he'd do anything he wanted in Smoke on the Water, but he had to go. <laughs> he could only wanted Harry Star, but he had to do. Um, you know, at that point he had to. So he 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 was conscious of the hook lines, but I mean. They never. They were probably the best band in the world as far as improvising goes, because they just go off. I mean, and they were also they they weren't one of these bands that um, had just. Started. They were all classically, you know, virtuosos. So they when they went off, it was just an amazing experience to watch. You know, they just go into different grooves, different everything, and then they'd sort of work their way back into the original thing. And that wasn't rehearsed. Yeah, but that's, that's a good side of rock and roll, which I, unfortunately I never saw. I mean, I saw Deep Purple with Steve Morse, which is still a great band, but I'm, but I'm a bigger Blackmore fan. So, so yeah. I, I only saw him with, with Blackmore's Night and, the, and his Rainbow Reincarnation in 2016 or 7, 16, I think, yeah in Germany. Oh, that was, that was fun to see. Uh, but talking about smoke in the water and, and, and upstrokes, I, uh, I kind of think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, but it kind of seems to me that Blackmore used a lot of just upstrokes with lines like that instead of So 
he did stuff I feel like that. I mean, he was through his classical training. I think most of it was um, up and down, but it, it was more for flavor and effect that he'd do upstrokes. Yeah, that, that that's why. But I just yeah. wanted to have it confirmed if I kind of hear it correctly. But that's that, that that's definitely great. And uh, touring. So, what is that like? Being on the road. What is it like being on the road with road with Deep Purple? With Deep Purple, it was great because everything was first class. So occasionally, it'd be a private jet, um, and we're staying in really nice hotels and that. It's just the road. If you're if you're having to really struggle, you know, financially, if you can't afford to have. Um, I mean, the last tour we did, it was we had the tour bus, we had we flew, we had the tour bus, we stayed in nice hotels, um, and uh, sometimes when the, the promoter um, books the hotels, um, if you don't have money behind you or you're not making enough, if the they'll put you in sort of a cheaper hotel, which is, you know, it's it's as long as it's a bed, but it it, it can get wearing when you've got to, you know. Um, I, I I love touring, uh, but you know I like to do it. Especially at this age, I like to do it in comfort. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and just just as in my personal vacations, I I feel that as as I'm going older every year, I'm always spending more money on on comfort. Yeah, I mean when I was in my you know eighteen nineteen in my twenties. I would be happy to get in the van and, you know, travel with the road crew, the van, and we'd sleep in the van, you know, save money on the hotels, just have enough money to, to eat once a day. And those were the early days. I mean, they were tough, but they, they were fun. But yeah. wouldn't want to do it, wouldn't want to do it now. <laughs> well, I think that's the natural progression of, of maturing or, <laughs> or growing up. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's really good to have things to look back on, experiences to have. Oh yeah. And those were some of the happiest times of my life. We, we just travel around the country and around Europe and oh, oh, it was just great, you know? Yeah, that, that's, that, that's a great thing, yeah. No responsibilities. <laughs> yeah. However, I'm, I'm kind of feeling that, not just COVID, but, but the whole music industry changing is kind of stopped the the old school rock god or rock icon status and, and, and touring and everything that was in the in the eighties, nineties that's that's really declining nowadays, I or it seems to me. Yeah, it it really is. I mean since the advent of Spotify and Apple Music, I mean you can't make money selling music anymore. Yeah. And nobody can. I mean it doesn't matter who you are, you can't make decent money selling music. Um it's every time someone plays a song on Spotify, you get 0 0.002 of a cent. So by the time a thousand people have heard your song, you got two cents, one of which goes to the record company. The other cent gets split between five guys. It's just, it's insane. Um, so you, that's, that's sort of gone out the window. And uh, also there's, they've te it's taken the magic away with things like meet and greets and it's always fun to to go out and do that if you've had a good gig you're in the right right mood but if you if you haven't and you, you're tired you just want to go back to the hotel and you have to sort of go and do this si signing which can take you know an hour hour and a half and you just you just want to go and rest if you've been if you just flew in this that morning or came in, in the tour bus and uh, it's so it, it, but it's also taken away the magic of the the unapproachable yeah. rock star. It's uh, there. There was, you know, you, you can't get away with it now. If you're in a band, you have to do meet and greets and that. Whereas, yeah. unless you're the status of someone like Deep Purple, where they go no and they just leave. Yeah, and I I, I get it, but personally, I I I would. I wouldn't like to meet Blackboard personally because I just kind of feel that he's my hero from a distance and uh, I don't think we need to talk. <laughs> I'm not sure we would be friends. So, so <laughs> and he doesn't need me fanboying out or, or pestering him with questions. So, and I'm not sure if I would be able to constrain myself. So 
I think it's the, the, the only interaction I ever had with him was, uh, was actually on a Black Morse Night show here in Hungary. I had this hat on, which is almost the exact same German hat that he has. And uh, so I was, I was wearing that, sitting in the first row. And after the first or the second song, he came to the center stage where I was living. He pointed at me and said, that's a nice hat. And he went back to playing the guitar. And I was like, that's all the interaction I ever needed with him. So, so that, that, that was quite enough for me. That's probably more, than, more, than, more interaction than he's had with a lot of people. <laughs> I bet. And they just... And the thing is with Richie, I mean, as I said, he's one of the most intelligent people I know, the funniest, but he's very shy. And he would, he would use that persona to keep people back because, you know, he was shy about interacting. And, you know, it, it gave him a lot of sort of uh, privacy but I don't think he did himself any favors when it came to the press because he had that unapproachable image. Whereas Jeff Beck and Richie Be and Eric Clapton and um, Jimmy Page, they 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 be more amiable to the press, and that that's why you know they, they got a lot more press, got their, their names got bigger. Richie's consistent, yeah. even even on a bad night for Richie, he's still sounding better than most people. You mentioned acoustic guitar playing and your acoustic band or duo with the lady singer. And I kind of remember that there's, there's a really good cover of uh, See That My Grave Is Kept Clean with Glenn Hughes on it, yeah. the albums. Did you play the dobro or the slide guitar in the beginning? No, that's Richie Sambora. Oh. Uh, he was my brother-in-law at the time. I was married to Heather Lockley's sister, right. uh, Colleen. And, uh, so Richie was uh, my brother-in-law, and I, when I got the, the deal for the Heaven and Earth album, I called Richie, he was my first call, I said, hey, listen, I'm doing this, uh, I got this deal for the solo album, will you come and sing a song, come and sing a couple of songs? And he had sing, no one ever asked me to sing. <laughs> and so he came, he came down and he sang When a Blind Man Cries and just did an amazing job. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then at the beginning um, of, see that my, and then he also played guitar on, uh, uh, do you ever think of me? Uh, and originally I was going to have him sing that, but um, Kelly Hansen was in the studio that night and uh, he'd sung it before. So Richie said, well, how's it go? And so Kelly went in and sang it. And Richie said, well, you should sing it. And so Richie just played guitar on it. Um, but then when we, uh, I needed a, a I, I played the acoustic at the beginning of See That My Grave's Clean. And I said, you know what would be great here is a, a dobro. And I knew Richie played dobro, so uh, I asked him to come and play on it. So he did. Again, we can always do this again and uh, you know, add more stuff if you need to. Yeah, that would be awesome. And also, if touring is back on and you're, you're coming to Europe, I hope we can do this live. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. That would be awesome. And especially if, if you if you are playing with, with George, the my keyboard the Hungarian keyboard player friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, I was pretty happy to to hear that that he was playing on the album. I yeah, he's that. great. I mean I I I, 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 we, I someone told me about him on Instagram and I found he'd done a, a cover of Dreams of Desire, the uh -huh. um, the song of the first album and also uh, the uh, solo at the end of um, Hard to Kill. Oh, well, this guy's great. And so we, we needed a keyboard solo, a keyboard player, and so I got in touch with him. And, uh, that was a great idea. I, <laughs> I definitely am very happy and very glad that happened because, like I said earlier, there aren't many opportunities for, for rock players or just musicians in Hungary at all so i think I think george getting that opportunity from you that's that really bored my heart and, yeah, I, well, and it seemed to me that he did or, or or as i was listening to the album i think he did a great job oh yeah amazing job and hopefully we can get out on tour it's just just tough at the moment with this covid hopefully we can get out on tour and we'll get to meet up one day that would be awesome i'm kind of guessing that if i upload this video there's going to be questions in um, in the comments so maybe we can follow that up if there are... Yeah, we do a follow-up follow one. Yeah, that would be awesome. And but once again, I'm, I really appreciate you taking... You're welcome. Me. And I really enjoy the stories. I just...
just seeing everything from inside. That's yeah. to me as a fan, it's an incredible opportunity. Well, you're welcome. And let's do it again. Thank you so much, Stuart.